Good morning. My name is Aaron Wills. I'm a recent William S. Richardson School of Law graduate, and I am currently working as a paralegal and a consultant for Hole Kelly Consulting under the direction of retired Judge Mike Town. This is the second show in a series of shows entitled Rehabilitation Coming Soon, where we discuss mass incarceration practices of the United States and the effect of those practices on the state of Hawaii. Last week, our guest was Bob Merce, who recently visited Norway to study one of the most successful prison programs systems in the world. Today we will continue this discussion and here is a little background to get us started. This is an introduction from the letter of intent and application to the state of Hawaii entitled Beyond Bricks and Mortar. Hawaii's correctional system is at a crossroads. Our get tough on crime policies of the 1980s and 1990s filled our prisons to overflowing and forced us to send almost one third of our inmates to private pris prisons on the mainland where they are isolated from their families land and culture. The state also put off repairing its correctional facilities <clears throat> for decades with the result that many of them are now falling apart. Including the largest facility, the Oahu Community Correctional Center, parts of which were built in 1916. The cost of our correctional system has risen steadily to over 230 million in 2013. Yet our correctional outcomes are consistently poor as evidenced by the fact that over half of our parolees reoffend within three years with the average time to recidivism just 15 months. And if all that wasn't enough, in August of 2014, the Council of State Government Justice Center gave policymakers more bad news, including Hawaii's combined prison and jail population remained essentially unchanged between 2000 and 2013 at approximately 6,000 prisoners, while during roughly the same time period, 2003 to 2012, Hawaii's crime rate decreased by 39%. Violent crime decreased by 10.3% and property crime decreased by 40.5%. So between 2006 and 2011, the average length of probation increased 25%, stretching the, the judiciary's adult probation supervisory capabilities almost to the breaking point. The parole approval rate declined from 40% in 2006 to 34% in 2010, because prisoners are unable to get the programming they need. The number of prisoners who chose to serve their maximum sentences rather than being paroled and who must therefore be released without supervision of any kind more than doubled from 121 in fiscal year 2006 to 247 in fiscal year 2011. And the most recent state of Hawaii payouts to victims due to, this, due to the failures in this system include a case that in the fall of 2011, where prisoner Aaron Persian was nursing a small scratch on his forearm, this scratch became infected and nobody noticed the injury during his initial health screening. In a matter of days, the infection triggered a septic shock that put him on life support at Queens Medical Center. Mr. Persian lived, but all of his fingers and both of his feet had to be amputated. On October 15, 2015, the state reached a settlement in the amount of $7.2 million to compensate Mr. Persian for damages. A few months later, the state then agreed to pay $625,000 to a, a family of another inmate whose kidney disease went untreated for months before he was found dead in his cell at the Halava Correctional Facility. Senator Will Aspero summed it up best by saying, I'm appalled that we had to pay millions due to our own neglect. We can't keep doing this. All of this points to the conclusion that our sentencing and correctional policies are not working. They are not producing acceptable, cost-effective, and sustainable outcomes for the people of Hawaii. Our guest today is Dr. Mita Chesney Lind, who is and teaches at, uh, at Women's Studies at the University of Hawaii. She is nationally recognized for her work on women in crime. Her testimony before Congress resulted in a national support of gender responsive programming for girls in the juvenile justice system. She has just finished two edited collections one on trends in girls' violence entitled Fighting for Girls, Critical Perspectives on Gender and Violence, and the other, a collection of international essays entitled Feminist Theories of Crime. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. <laughs> well, as you've heard in our introduction, we have a big problem. Yeah. And I just wanted to open it up by you know, kind of getting your thoughts on the system as a whole, but what has been the trend in terms of Hawaii's imprisonment patterns over the past few decades? Well, as you noted, uh, the nation has gone through mass imprisonment, and we in Hawaii have gone through essentially the same process. 
local style, if you will. And I lived through it as, as some in this room have lived through it. When I came here as a graduate student um, in the 70s, uh, there were 250 people at uh, what, we, what you just referred to as OCCC. Okay. That was it for the, for the state. Uh, that was the entire prison population. 250. 250. Wow. And um, at the time, you know, everybody ha had issues with, you know, how are we going to handle these folks. Uh, there were no women in prison. We didn't have a women's prison at all. Um, there was one woman um, that was housed at, you know, in, in a jail-like facility, uh, which was what Halava used to be. Okay. Um, and that, that was our prison system. And now we have, as you noted, uh, close to 6,000 inmates. Right. Um, and somewhere between a quarter and a third of those inmates, uh, horrifically, are doing time in mainland prisons, many of them for-profit uh, facilities like the, uh, the one that we have out in, Ari in a remote part of Arizona that's been built specifically for Hawaii inmates, which is a, an obscene kind of uh, reflection of, of Hawaii's pattern of incarceration. One of the things I want to also note, you, you mentioned that the crime rate has been going down and yet our imprisonment has stayed stable. That's Actually, right. that's contrary to the national pattern. Nationally, uh, the, the imprisonment rate has been drifting down, but Hawaii, in the last year for which we have data, um, actually increased our imprisonment by 4.1 percent, uh, 4.2 okay. percent. So, you know, nationally we're going down, Hawaii is still going up. Um, and this is with a very uh, de marked decrease in crime. And, and every, every, let's, let's now address this because everyone wants to rush to, well, one reason the crime rate went down is because we locked up so many people. Okay. Uh, but the, the science on that is, is pretty much to the contrary. There's very little relationship between incarceration rates and crime rates. So, you know, you can forget that. Basically, states that have um, high incarceration rates have not, in some cases, shown any decrease in crime. Other states like New York that have been dramatically reducing their reliance on crime have also seen a crime drop. Okay. So the crime rate and the incarceration rate aren't as as related as people might imagine. So what we really are seeing is, here's a, here's a state with a relatively minor crime problem um, and r relying increasingly on incarceration. And, and, it's gonna, and it's costing us an enormous amount of money. Um, and it's also costing certain communities a lot of heartache because especially if their uh, folks are on the mainland, there's very little likelihood that they're gonna be able to stay connected with them. Okay, and I, you know, I don't know if you know this, um, what the figures are, but are, do you know how much Hawaii spends on incarceration, and what has been some of the trade-offs locally as Hawaii has expanded reliance on the imprisonment? Well, you know, I teach at the university, as you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. and, and the University of Hawaii has seen a dramatic decrease in uh, state support for higher education. So they're really, and I've seen it over, again, my career, I've seen us go from a state that really valued higher education and made education very affordable for its students, uh, and really a kind, it was a kind of a, a great gift that Hawaii gave the young people in our state, was that you had a very affordable and excellent high quality education. Increasingly, the university is turning to our own students to replace the money that the state has put in prisons. So it's classrooms and cells, and you were talking earlier about all the student loan debt that so many of our young people are now shouldering. That's a byproduct of our love affair with incarcerating mostly low-level drug offenders. That's who we basically have in prison in Hawaii. We don't have, um, you know, a lot of serial killers. We don't have a, a very high violent crime rate. We, we do have some problems with assaultive behaviors, but some of that's a product of drug addiction that hasn't been treated effectively in the community. So mostly what we're locking up are people who could, and especially the people who are on the mainland, many of them could be in community programs if we had a rich array of those to offer them. Now on that note, um, let's talk a little bit about, and you mentioned this, that CCA has a prison in Saguaro yeah. that they ha house Hawaii prisoners. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit how they go about selecting the prisoners and well, how they're different? You know, one of the things that's so heartbreaking, uh, people may imagine that this facility is full of the, the worst of the worst, the kind of Guantanamo right. of Hawaii, uh, but that's not the case. Uh, CCA wants uh, relatively 
uh, low-level offenders uh, who are easy to manage. And they pretty much, that's what they ask for, and that's what they get from us. So instead of the worst of the worst going to the mainland, uh, we're, we're really talking about a lot of people who should be doing their time here who have very minor uh, criminal histories relative to the people who are currently doing time here and who need to, we need to be worried about getting those people back into the community uh, so they don't reoffend. And so that reentry process is terribly hampered by the fact that they're thousands of miles away in a remote little um, uh, community in Arizona. So how can they arrange for housing? How can they arrange to get a job uh, when they get out of right. prison? All of those kinds of things that, that make it less likely that people are going to reoffend. those are all exacerbated by where they are. Right. Now, I, I don't know, you know, th these are, you know, really hard questions for anybody to answer, but, you know, how does Hawaii compare to the rest of the country in terms of imprisonment? And specifically, what are some of the reasons that we've relied on these imprisonment patterns that Hawaii has actually relied on this mm -hmm. for? Like, mm -hmm. why are we in this situation? Right well, uh, we, sh we share some things with the mainland that I, that I want to kind of mention. The first is um, many people who are in prison are not in prison for new crimes. They've actually been in prison, they got out of prison, and then they get reincarcerated because they violated a condition of, of what's called parole. And so they get reincarcerated. And people think, oh, well, that's you know a theme in re uh, Hawaii's incarceration. No, it's actually the ma a major story. It's anywhere between 40 and 60 percent of our inmates are often there for parole or probation revocation. Okay. Now, that begins to offer some ways out of our current situation, and, w and we can talk about that later. Okay. So we share that with our mainland counterparts. Where we are different um, is that we are, sh we are shipping so many of our inmates to other states. Very few states do that. R right now, only four in, in the country uh, do this kind of behavior, and many of them don't do it to the degree that Hawaii does it. Okay. So we are outliers in this transportation of our crime problem. Uh, and shipping people to, again, for-profit, as you note, facilities with terrible records. These are not excellent facilities, and we're getting a great, a great bargain. We're, we're sending people to uh, problematic facilities. I, I happen to know because of um, some work that I've done about the situation in Arizona, and our inmates are in, uh, that are doing time in that facility are exposed to the death penalty if they do get in a terrible situation in that facility right. and happen to commit a very serious crime, uh, they could face the death penalty. Now that's another kind of example of something that wouldn't happen if they were doing time in Hawaii because Hawaii does not have the death penalty. And yet because our inmates are, these young men are doing time in Arizona, now we have at least one young man from Hawaii, uh, Micah Kanahele. It's public information that he's facing the death penalty there. So that's another way that, that Hawaii differs from the mainland. But I think the main thing is that we have a relatively low crime rate as a state, and we need to, our, our incarceration policies need to begin to reflect the fact, the fact that we have a lot of opportunities to work with people in the community, and we aren't taking them, candidly. We're, we actually are more conservative than, than states like Arizona and Texas when it comes to some of our policies, particularly around bail, particularly around probation and parole revocations. Um, you know, states like California, that's how they've been reducing their prison population is by re-looking at things like parole and probation. Okay. And quickly, right before we take our break, um, I was just wondering, do you know off the top of the head how much we're paying CCA to take care of our prisoners in Arizona a year? I think that we pay them about $30 million a year, wow. and that's an enormous check to, to send out of state, again, to a, a, a big company uh, who, who profits from, from our misery and from the misery of Hawaii inmates. Okay. Well, please stay tuned. We'll continue with Dr. Chesney Lind after our, these messages. Thank you. Aloha. My name is Carl Campagna. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. You can see our show every Wednesday at noon at 12 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com, as well as visiting YouTube and finding the link for the show there. The show is also aired on OC16. We look forward to seeing you on the show. Uh, we have many wonderful guests, uh, including Joan Husted, Corey Rosenley, where we talk about the very important issues of education for our keiki. We look forward to seeing you there. Mahalo. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. 
My name is Anu Hittel, and I host the show called Climate Change Beyond Outrage. We go beyond outrage to find solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. I hope you will join me here every Tuesday at 1 o'clock. We broadcast live from thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha and bye-bye. Welcome back. We're sitting here with uh, Dr. Chesney Lind, and we are discussing our show, which is called Rehabilitation Coming Soon, and this specific show is entitled Beyond Bricks and Mortar. And uh, um, Dr., I, basically, you know, we know that we have a strong and native Hawaiian community here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, how is this affecting that community in particular? Well, you know, uh, my husband is native Hawaiian, and I've lived through the Hawaiian Renaissance here, which has been just a remarkable set of uh, experiences. And he he was on Kaho'olawe in the 70s. Uh, and, you know, so we have a, a lot of exciting things going on within the Hawaiian community, a lot of positives. Uh, you know, I can remember when Hawaiian language was dying on our, our college campuses and I remember having to fight. I was then teaching at Honolulu Community College because we had a dean who wanted to do away with it because he said, you can't get a job if you speak Hawaiian. Oh, <laughs> How times have changed. So <laughs> yeah. there's been I, a lot in my life that I've seen that's been very positive uh, for Hawaiians and Hawaiian students. On our campuses, we've gotten money to, to do a better job of supporting Hawaiian students through uh, especially through the undergraduate and and I would hope that we can do a better job of supporting Native Hawaiian students through graduate school. Kamehameha Schools has a lot of money. Uh, they should be helping Hawaiian students in a very direct way so that we we see the range of ethnicities in all the professions um, dramatically you know increase. Uh, so those are all positive things that have been going on in the Native Hawaiian community and there's a lot of political vibrancy for sure around issues like sovereignty. But I guess as a criminologist, I've been a little heartsick to not see much interest in any of the Native Hawaiian serving organizations when it comes to the situation of Native Hawaiians in prison. And I would, I would want to talk about kids in the juvenile justice system as well. Because if we go to our youth prison, uh, which is a Hawaii Youth Correctional Facility, um, about 60% of the kids who are there are Native Hawaiian. That's a dramatic overrepresentation of what native wines are in the general population. So when we go to the Hawaiian, uh, the real Hawaiian housing project in Hawaii, it's prison. And the same overrepresentation is seen in the adult system. And it's particularly pronounced as, as somebody who's looked at girls in juvenile justice and women in prison, it's actually more pronounced among the girls than among the boys. Mm -hmm. So there's an interesting interaction between gender and ethnicity. We're still policing uh, the sexuality uh, and the deportment of girls of, of Native Hawaiian ancestry, just as we did, you know, 300 years ago when, when you know, contact or yeah, when contact first happened, um, and you know, our own queen was incarcerated uh, at, at one point in her life, and, and it was a very traumatic experience for her. So the Native Hawaiian community has a long history of, of involvement with the criminal justice system um, as consumers, you, you know, putting it, I don't want to sound frivolous about this, but um, there, um, there's a, an, an enormous impact of mass incarceration on the Hawaiian community, but it's not a topic of conversation in that community the way it has been among, especially the African American community on the mainland. Uh, when you think about police accountability, uh, that's another area that I've done some work in. And uh, it's interesting to me that no one talks about the ethnicity of the young men that are shot by the Honolulu Police Department. My guess is that most are low-level drug offenders and that many are Native Hawaiian. We just don't always have the ethnic information there. On the mainland, it's easier to see, right. to see those kinds of patterns. But Native Hawaiians are overrepresented. The official statistics that the um, Office of Hawaiian Affairs yeah. did do an outstanding okay. study. Um, and then they, got, they hit the political flack that happens when an, uh, uh, an ethnic community begins to talk about criminal justice, which is that they get attacked for you know, being uh, basically wanting to be quote unquote soft on crime. And so I think the Office of Hawaiian Affairs had a very rough time. The prosecutor went after them. Um, there was not a lot of political support in the legislature when they tried to talk about these issues. Um, and <laughs> I have to, 
I'd say this. Uh, it, uh, the, the academic that they hired to do the work, uh, they didn't hire me because I guess they perceived me to be uh, quote unquote biased. Uh, I'm not sure why. I, the, I had done a lot of the research that made the case to get uh, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs involved and to get the legislature involved in looking at this issue. But they went and hired a guy from another department uh, who was not a criminologist. Uh, and when, when he came out with his data, which showed discrimination against Native Hawaiians, and mm -hmm. when the Office of Hawaiian Affairs was getting political flack, your job as an academic when you, know, when you do a study like that is when the people who paid you to do the study uh, are, are under fire for your data, you're there shoulder to shoulder with them to, to um, basically explain how you gathered the data and what the data mean. Right. He headed for the hills, and he's literally now gone. Oh, he's left right. the state. So um, anyway, that's the, I, I. All right, put the crying towel down. Uh, <laughs> but the 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 reality is that Office of Wine Affairs did try to do an and did do an excellent study. Lana Kaupu was a part of that uh, research group, and her work is very powerful in documenting the harms to the Hawaiian community. But you've got to remember, when you lock up one person, you really you really jail a whole family. Yeah, that's right. It's not just one person. And as, if you read Civil Beat just this morning. You talk, you're talking to a Native Hawaiian family that's spending thousands of dollars to travel to Arizona to basically see their family member. And this is not a community that has two or three thousand dollars that they can spend a piece to go on trips like this. Right. So you know you can see it, and we parole people to in vast numbers to places like Waianae, and anyone who knows that community knows how challenged it is economically. Uh, it's geographically remote. It's basically you're turning young men into back to a community that has very little in the way of resources, very little in the way of jobs. And no surprise that within a couple of months, they've probably relapsed on drugs. They've probably come back into town and yeah. gotten back in trouble again. That's the right. cycle. That's right. And that's what, and we put them back in prison. That's right. And you know, just to kind of enlighten what the statistics were that OHA found in this uh, report that yeah. they came out with. And I wrote my paper based on this in law school, so you know, correct yeah, me if yeah. I'm wrong on these statistics. No, no, but I believe it was uh, the Native Hawaiians represent about 14% of the total population in yep. Hawaii, but they represent 43% as far as an incarceration rate of yep. going into jail, which is higher than any other ethnicity yep. group here in Hawaii. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's a and, and and what the big debate was always, uh, you know, is it just that Hawaiians are more criminal, therefore there are more of them in, in prison, or is it that there's an actual bias against uh, Hawaiians in prison, uh, or, or Hawaiians in the criminal justice system, and that's where the study made its, base, its most significant contribution, because it showed that at every level, Hawaiians were being disadvantaged uh, over and above the, the controlling for the effects of the original offense. Right. So there's clear evidence of discrimination and bias, and yet we've we've sort of continued as if that study didn't happen. It was like, never mind, you know? And I'm like, excuse me, you spent a very large sum of money, you pointed to a real social problem in our community, and it's one we need, we just need to have, the, I'm so glad we're having this conversation, because we need to have it, we need to have the Native Hawaiian community um, ally with those of us who understand these issues uh, within higher education, uh, and get, get the law school involved, uh, and get some of the very key organizations in our community to address the evidence of racism and to and to de-incarcerate a population that doesn't need to be in prison right. uh, in the in the first place and going along with what we were talking about last time I mean what we want from this system is to produce people who are not going to reoffend right. and go back into right. jail we want right. to produce people who we could call our neighbors again that's right and who are rehabilitated and people have to understand that the vast majority of the people we send to prison come back out they will be your neighbor Absolutely, and yeah. either you want them to be your neighbor in the positive way or you end up with with uh, very troubled folks who are living next door to you because their problems have not been addressed they haven't been able to get a job and so they've fallen back into the patterns that got them in trouble in the first place I saw this I lived in Kaava before moving to town and uh, because it's a very mixed neighborhood I knew of families where where people came out of prison couldn't get a job, tried to get a job, but, but of course there's that master status um, and many, and many uh, federal benefits. They can't, for example, get loans to go to higher education. If you have a drug offense, you can't um, uh, qualify for federal housing. I mean, we've, we've put all these additional penalties on people who are already very marginalized. 
And I saw a family struggle with this, and I saw a young man struggle with it. And all of a sudden, he was wearing a lot of jewelry and driving a fancy car. And we all knew what it meant, and it meant he was going to be going back to prison. And sure enough, that's what happened. And he did live next door to us for a while. <laughs> so I knew about this. Yeah. And y you do, you can't, and, and no one can be walled off from this problem. We are a very, very small state, yeah, and it's yeah. all of our responsibility to heal people and to get people um, and and this this I, I can see his face you know there this was a nice and is a nice guy and he comes from a nice family um, and they need help the family needs help and he needs help dealing with drugs mm -hmm. um, we, we had another uh, we were uh, burglarized several times in Cahaba virtually every time because it was a small and restorative community we got back most of our stuff because oh, nice. well, <laughs> the, the, the coconut <laughs> wireless works in Kaaba. Oh, yeah. Well, in one case, it was a, the brother. Um, and this is a long story, but uh, maybe just to, to short circuit it, my husband, after the first burglary, put in an elaborate uh, security system. And so we were a local news story because we had a picture of this uh, young guy going through our house taking our stuff. His, Ian put it on Facebook. His, his, Net, his niece on the mainland saw it and said, I think that's uncle so-and-so, called her father. He got the stuff back for us. He brought it to our house. Oh, boy. And he said, I'm really <laughs> sorry. You know, we've been working with my brother. We're trying to get him into drug treatment. We're trying to get him to stop ripping off people. So I, I, there's an, there's a, Hawaii is a perfect place to talk about restorative justice. Right. We are a forgiving community. I, I forgive the people that took our stuff. I got new stuff. You know, you can get more stuff. Uh, you want people to be healed, and, and prisons do yep. a poor job of that. Yep. And one thing that you know, they don't like to talk about is a lot of these men that go into prisons, and women, um, have kids in the community. Oh, yeah. And the recidivism oh, yeah. rate of these kids, and if you look at the statistics, is in the 70 to 80 yes. percent, or yep. I mean, it, uh, for them to get involved in the legal system and then to be repeat offenders after that. Is That's right. All, uh, the vast majority of, of these folks, and this is particularly true if we're talking about women, have children. And when you imprison, especially a woman, you imprison her kids as well because Absolutely. she's likely the custodial parent. Right. So yeah. now everybody's scrambling to take care of the kids. The kids are not going to do well in this yeah. in this system. And the fifty thousand dollars a year it takes to just house one prisoner goes uh, way deeper when yeah. you have to house the kids in foster care That's right. and do That's and the right. wards of the state. And so it gets up to around maybe two hundred thousand dollars for maybe yes. even one family. That's right. To house the for the state to house. That's them. right. Okay, um, well, I'd like to, s to switch gears here a little bit and talk more about um, what your specialty is, which is in women's studies. Right, um, right, right. Uh, and, um, and when we do that, we'll talk when we come back. And uh, my name is Aaron Wills, and we're sitting with Dr. Mida Chesney Lind, and we're talking about Beyond Bricks and Mortar. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, and one of our delights is to be partnered with Think Tech Hawaii and produce programs every week. Every Monday at 2 o'clock, we have a show called Ehana Kako, which means let's work together. So we bring people from all across the nation and the country, and certainly throughout the islands together here to talk with them about how to work together, and how to work together to do the following, to build a better economy, a better government, a better society. So if you're interested in the research of our think tank, the Gr Grassroot Institute, or if you're interested in how that's applied at the governmental and community and business levels, you'll enjoy the fascinating conversations with our guests on Ehana Kako every week on Think Tech Hawaii at 2 o'clock on Mondays. Until our next show, I'll see you. <laughs> Aloha. Welcome back. My name is Aaron Wills, and we're going to continue our discussion with uh, Dr. Mita Chesney Lind. Um, I just wanted to um, ask you about women in general in prison. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's going on there? I know there were some problems that we used to transfer our women to, just like the men, yeah. but we don't do that anymore. I wonder right. if you could talk a little bit about that and just what's going sure. on with our women in prison here in Hawaii. Well, uh, again, I can talk about my own history. I remember when we had one woman in prison in Hawaii, uh, and that was uh, Yvonne Thunder Park, and she, she had uh, been involved in a very high-profile murder. But we had no other women in prison. Uh, we used to ship our women to mainland prisons right. for that reason. Um, we were not alone. There were many states in the country that had no prisons for women. That was prior to mass incarceration. 
Now, as you know, we have hundreds of women in prison um, out in um, Kailua, yeah. a facility that's overcrowded, that is incredibly deteriorated. It's basically a portion of the former youth facility. Like all the other facilities, uh, they're, they're very dis disturbing to go through, even though the staff are, are highly dedicated. Um, it's just hard to work in places like that, and it's very hard to do your time in places like that. But that's a situation uh, women have been afterthoughts in the correctional process nationally, even though we now um, account for a bigger proportion of the imprisoned population than we did when mass incarceration started. And that reflects the fact that what we basically did in the 70s and 80s was decide that we were going to criminalize drug addiction. Mm -hmm. And this had an enormous and negative effect on women who have problems with victimization, have problems with abuse, and have used drugs as a way to kind of self-medicate. Um, yep. um, and so our women in prison in Hawaii, that's the profile. We don't, you know, the few women who are doing time for murder have often been involved in tragic vehicular, um, you know, accidents. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe some have had uh, very bad uh, problems themselves and, and with abusive boyfriends have killed an infant. Those are our most serious female offenders. But the vast majority are there for drug, uh, drug offenses. They, they could easily, and they were in the community before. When I started uh, in graduate school, all of these women were in community programs and in drug treatment. Now, they're, now we're spending, as you say, uh, millions of dollars uh, housing them and in very, as I say, very poor conditions. And I say this with great aloha for the, the warden who gave us a, a very powerful tour of his facility and was talking about all, all that he's trying to do. But he faces enormous challenges because of the physical plant mm -hmm. and because so many women are housed there. There was a period of time where Hawaii, like with our male inmates, we shipped female inmates to uh, CCA facilities. The one that got the New York Times story started um, was in Otter Creek, which is a small community in Kentucky. And CCA uh, staff were right. systematically sexually abusing large numbers of the women who were in prison there. Right. So um, as I say, this, this wasn't just a local local scandal. And we've had several of those, including some more recently with yeah. our women's facility. That brings up another problem. When you have cross-gender supervision of, of women offenders, and this goes back to the beginning of women's imprisonment, you have problems. Um, it's it's right. just a very, very toxic situation where you have enormous power on the in the hands of the adult correctional officers, or, um, and you have very powerless inmates. Uh, you just have a recipe for disaster. So these, these scandals, you know, we just had one erupt at, at our women's facility here. We've had them erupt in Maui. We have had, you know, allegations virtually um, every couple of years. Yeah, that's right. um, it, it, we've had problems at our youth facility. We had guards who were sexually assaulting the girls. Uh, when you put girls and women in prison, um, in addition to shattering their family life and, and throwing their kids into foster care or into really uh, strained situations with grandparents or relatives. Um, you have all this victimization that happens. And, and it, it's to the point where um, Hawaii is, and like the rest of the country, uh, has been investigated by uh, Human Rights Watch yeah, yeah, yeah. and by Amnesty International. I mean, the fact that our, uh, America relies, well, we're the world's largest incarcerator. Yeah, we are. When we when we do this with, with our people, uh, we create these ancillary social problems which bring human rights organizations to look at what we're doing in our prisons and in, in, our, in our training schools. So that's the, that's the difference when we talk about girls and women. And I guess it breaks my heart when I go out to the women's prison to see all these young women there um, in kind of desperate straits, uh, wanting to be out and in the community, uh, and then knowing that most of them could be. And most of them 20 years ago were out in the community. Uh, they do need drug treatment. They do need help um, healing from whatever traumatic uh, experiences they had in their childhoods. And most women offenders have extensive histories of trauma. Uh, the fact that there's so many Native Hawaiian women um, is another issue that we don't want to forget, because the Native Hawaiian uh, cultural trauma, again, I mentioned 
that Queen Liliuokalani herself was imprisoned. So we have a long history of imprisoning uh, Hawaiian women and policing Hawaiian uh, girls and women and around sexuality issues. That's virtually all we do in the juvenile justice system. The vast majority of the girls that are at the detention center, when I looked at the data, um, were there for running away from home. Uh, most of these are homes that are pretty abusive and pretty troubled. Um, they're the victims of sexual abuse. Maybe some of them get involved with um, survival sex on the ru on the run, mm -hmm. but uh, and we put them we put them in kid jail and kid prison for that stuff. So and that it, that it doesn't end there. It it continues. If you look at um, we have many more adult women in prison than we have girls in the juvenile facilities for it. Um, and that that is weird because when I started out, it was just the reverse. We had so many more girls in uh, the juvenile prison and, and very few women in adult prison. And now it's just reversed. And that's good. Um, I want to talk a little bit about reform efforts. Yeah. And we do have, uh, in the case of Hoy's juvenile justice system, uh, we had an assessment done. Uh, Judge Browning led this effort. I want to do, uh, and, and real credit to, to Judge Browning for leading this. Uh, the Office of Youth Services was also involved, and there was a look taken at our kids in our Hawaii Youth Correctional Facility, and this was done by uh, scholars from Pew Research, mm -hmm. and they did this assessment, and they said, look, you're spending $100,000 a year per kid out here, and they're misdemeanors. <laughs> what are you doing, Hawaii? And so we've reduced the size of our training school dramatically from uh, a high of close to 100 kids. We're down around 20 something kids. So that can happen. Uh, it's already happened in our youth facility, and there hasn't been a lot of media coverage of it. Uh, but I think it's a tremendous success story, and it shows what can be done if policymakers in key positions. And, and by that, I don't just mean the people who, the people who run the correctional facilities are the first to tell you, we have no control over this. We simply get up in the morning, and people are delivered to our door that we have to house. Right. That's what our, our, the head of public safety in Hawaii points out. So when we started talking about correctional reform, he said, please don't just ask public safety uh, to sit at the table, because we're not the ones that send the people here. He wanted the judiciary here uh, at the table. He wants the, the community at the table. Uh, and so I, I really, um, I'm, I was very impressed with that view. And you know, a group of us have gotten together to try and talk about what Hawaii could do differently. Right. Uh, and, we, and we face a crisis, because um, <laughs> now the, the, what used to be the prison that's turned into the jail is sitting on enormously uh, expensive property because the rail line is going to go right where OCCC is, is sitting. And so in crisis is born opportunity, so I hope we have a, a statewide conversation to talk about do we really build another giant prison in Halava next to a twin giant prison out there, or do we do something different in Hawaii? Um, and, and that's really where I'd like the conversation to go um, at some point. But back to the women in prison thing, uh, we could empty out and, and uh, the current warden, I'm sure, would agree with me. We could empty out the women's prison tomorrow, and there would be virtually no danger to the public whatsoever. We could save enormous amounts of money uh, just trying that if we, if we were, were scared about letting out a whole lot of men. Uh, but I think another way to go, and this is the way that Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton have been talking about going, is to take low-level, nonviolent drug offenders and get them out of prison. And we've already had the, the head of public safety, uh, help me out with his name, I, I, I've lost it. Uh, uh, Nolan Espinda. Nolan Espinda has already asked the legislature for permission to release misdemeanors. He, he recognizes that they shouldn't be in prison. And again, we're, we're paying for this. This is not cheap. Well, in, in other shows, we're going to talk about some of the systems here in Hawaii, such as the probation system. Good. Uh, there's a couple of different probation systems operating right now. But one thing that uh, Bob brought up in the last program and, and I thought it was just a, a great lead into what we're talking about is, you know, for their adult correctional officers to even begin working with an inmate, they have to go to an academy for two years yeah. and yeah. then have to be educated on, on psychology, yeah. um, you know, all of the basics, uh, yeah. human interaction yeah. Yeah. And, and how you go about, you know, dealing with people who are in this state. And then what they do is after you graduate from the academy, you actually go um, 
to the prison, but they don't make you what they call contact officers, so you can't have contact with the prisoners until you've actually worked your way into the prison system for a couple of months. They get used to the way that you work. Wow. It's vastly different yeah. than the way we oh, do yeah. things here, where you know it's unionized, and it, as long as you pay your dues and things go through and you know your background yep. check is okay, you could be starting work within That's a right. month. That's right. That's right. You know, and um, in the education system, and as we all know, if you learn something really fast and it's a lot of information within a month, it's just going to go yep. right through oh, yeah. and oh, you're yeah. not going to retain anything. One of the things that, it, that, that differentiates the United States from almost all of our international counterparts is how poorly we pay and how poorly we train the people who work in our correctional systems right. and how poorly we support them. And I think uh, Director Raspinda was extremely pleased to hear uh, the, that the members of the task force that went to Norway coming back saying that we would support uh, there being an increase in, in the training requirements and in the remuneration for people who are dealing with, with difficult uh, folks and people who face a lot of challenges and people who need a lot of help. And our, our international um, counterparts, and we could talk about UK, we can talk about all these other countries that, that have much more innovative approaches to yeah. crime uh, and public safety. First of all, they incarcerate far fewer people, but the people they do incarcerate, they do a good job with. So their recidiv rate, recidivism rate is low. We incarcerate huge numbers of people. We do a very bad job of helping them. In fact, we mostly harm them. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think by design, we're not saying that people who are in corrections set out to harm the folks that they house. It's just that we have all these stigmas piled on and whatever programming we are able to deliver is is very minimal compared to the harms we're we're doing. Okay, and then on that note, you know, quickly before we're closing here, um, why is Hawaii talking about new facilities instead of new approaches to crime and public safety? Yeah. And what are the opportunities that Hawaii could explore instead of just another costly imprisonment, oh, building another system like we have? We, you know, I, I don't know exactly. I just know that uh, legislators that I've talked to have said that the, um, the amount of money that the governor has been talking about for this new facility, it will, it will dwarf all other... Uh, about $490 million, it's, I think, right? It's an enormous amount of money. Yeah. Uh, and the opportunity costs that, that Hawaii is going to you know, lose as a result of making that choice are enormous, and we really need to have a conversation before we, we, we do this. I mean, you wouldn't go out, you know, in, and in the next 10 minutes go buy a car uh, because you you know your car is having a few problems. That's where we are as a state. We're talking about going out and buying a Tesla. You know we're not just buying any car. We're we're going to build a, a a prison that will mean that we don't have you know uh, any new facilities at UH Manoa. We're, we may have to close campuses to pay for this prison. So um, yeah, let's let's take a deep breath here and talk about what else we could do. Um, and there's plenty more that we can do, but I think do we have a break coming or uh, we have about one minute left. Oh, we have money. Oh, we have to talk about parole and probation. Uh, we have to reinvigorate and re-energize those approaches. And it sounds like in future shows you'll be talking about just that. Yes, and we hope to be able to bring light. Uh, hopefully, this you know these shows go on. We can even bring a guest back like oh, you ah. who, who can talk <laughs> about a lot more things than just what we're talking about okay. today. So. Um, you know, I mean, I think these these conversations are necessary. I think we have to have the experts out here so they can actually enlighten us to what we're talking about here. Because I think if we keep doing what we're doing right now, oh. we're going to have the same kind of outcomes. Yes. And we're going to have just as bad as results that we've been getting for the last Absolutely. Years. It, thank you so much for starting the conversation. Yeah, no problem. It's thank been great you, to Dr. be here. for joining us. And uh, so join us next week as we continue the discussion for the, the mass incarceration practices of the United States and their effect on the state of Hawaii in our series called Rehabilitation Coming Soon. Stay tuned. Coming up next is Sustainable Hawaii with Kirsten Turner. Thank you. <laughs>